It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to see you all, and you're the future, and to have the honor to talk to you. Thanks for coming. So, yes, I will talk about thin film solar cell. Um, I will not talk about integrals and molecules. Um, I will take a step back, or maybe several steps back, and look at solar cells, what we have now, and why I think thin film solar cells are interesting, and um, what can we do to actually make these solar cells better. And the results I'm going to show, I didn't do them alone. This is my team in Luxembourg, and um, Alberto, who did most of the results I'm going to show, is actually not in the picture. And I would like to start with a problem, and it's a huge problem. This is um, the statistics of the world's primary energy use from 1990 to 2015, and the curve continues similar if you go further back. And you can, do, you can see two things there. One is it's ever increasing. This little dip here was the financial crisis of 2008. And the other thing that you can see is the huge part of our energy comes from sources that emit CO2, that contribute to the climate catastrophe. I think climate change is a euphemism. And this is what we have to get rid of. This is what we have to replace by renewable energies, and this is a huge task. But one solution comes up every morning, and we can use it. And we can use it by using solar cells. And at the moment, we are already using it. 2% of the world's electricity today is coming from um, solar cells, from photovoltaics. Uh, you may think this is a little, you may think it's a lot. It's, um, it's changing a lot. And having 2% of the world's electricity produced by solar energy, by, by photovoltaics, tells us we're not orders of magnitude away from, the pro from, from solving the problem. We can get it, we can get there. And, and we need to do more, obviously, but it's not hopeless. And there are areas where 7% uh, of the electricity consumption is covered uh, by, by photovoltaics. And in California, it's, um, I think, 12%. And this has been possible by a dramatic increase in the production volume of photovoltaic modules. The, the width here tells you how much um, uh, photovoltaic modules were produced. And in 2016, it was 75 gigawatt peak. What does that mean? It means that if you put all the solar modules that were produced in 2016 and put them in the sun, in the full sun at noon, you would get, you, you would have uh, an electricity uh, power generation of 75 gigawatts. Um, a big nuclear power station has one gigawatt. Of course, the nuclear power station can run about 80% of the time, and the solar cell obviously only produces energy when the sun is up. Um, what you also see here is that the blue one is silicon wafers. This is the, the standard solar cells. When you have a solar cell, on your roof or see a solar cell in the field, it's most likely that it's going to be silicon wafers. Sil it's, it's these blue disks that you, that you see in the, in the solar module. And a small part of this is thin film. And um, we're going to talk more about the thin film option. And this huge expanse of the production volume has been possible by a dramatic decrease in the price of the modules. And what we plot here is the, the price in, in euros, euros of 2016. Um, currencies changed their value, so 
if you go, if you do historical plots, you always have to to adjust the, the the change of the of the value of the currency. So this is um, in euros of 2016 per watt peak. So watt peak is is the size of a module that gives you uh, one watt electricity uh, when it's in the full sun, and um, it has come down from 20 euros to about 50 cents nowadays, and um, it follows a learning curve. What is plotted here is the cumulative production. So it's the amount of solar modules that have been produced over the time. Just we add up all the modules that have been produced. And when you have, um, it, normally when you have an industrial production, um, they follow these curves. When you when you produce more cars, you can make them cheaper. And when you produce more solar cells, you can make them cheaper. But this doesn't happen by itself. What's behind there is, this is euro per watt. So the two things that need to happen. The price needs to go down. This is a lot of engineering, a lot of innovation. But also the efficiency has to go up. And this is a lot of research that goes in there. And okay, each time the production doubles, the price decreased by 24%. That's the red line. And formal tags is is the underestimated solution to the world's prog problems. This is a study that came out this summer, and actually I've been waiting for this study for a long time. It's a study of studies. They looked at the historical predictions for photovoltaics and compare it to the real development. The red curve is really how much um, uh, photovoltaic modules are installed worldwide. And these this other curves are various predictions. Um, the green ones are from Greenpeace, so they were not made by people who didn't like photovoltaic. And all the curves are under the predictions. So photovoltaics, it's, it's, it's better than any predictions uh, that, that were there historical. And it's always developing fast and people don't think it's gonna develop so fast. So this is why I think that this 2% that we produce now is actually a good number because it's gonna be fast that we will have more. And these people who made the study then made um, a new prediction based on models that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, uses for their um, electricity, um, um, for, the, for the energy models. And um, what you see in this graph, the, the gray curve is actually, when you just use the historical rates, the highest and the lowest rates, you end up in the gray curve. Um, that's not realistic. And um, then these are several predictions that exist. And these curves are um, various are predictions that these people made. Um, and the difference is this learning curve will end at a certain price. And they made different assumption at which, which price this learning curve will end, and these are the different curves. And if we take the middle one, in, by 2050, 40% of the electricity uh, will be made by solar cells, and this is based on the IPCC models, which pr foresee a much higher share of electricity um, in, in the energy system. And if we take this curve, we have a huge increase. We have to produce 1,000 gigawatts a year solar cells. We're currently producing about 100 gigawatts a year. And if this is 40% of the electricity, the production of these um, modules, if, they're not, if, they, if we take a lot of energy to produce these modules, um, we might not even have the energy to produce these models modules, and therefore it's important that we have modules that use less energy to make them. And this is where thin film comes in. Thin film solar cells have several advantages. Um, here is an electron microscope picture of a, of a 
cross-section of a thin film solar cell. So here you see the glass. And then you have a back contact and a front contact. You want to get the electricity out, so you need both. And um, the whole thing is maybe three micrometers thick. So it's about 100 times thinner than um, the silicon wafers. So we need a lot less material. We need a lot less energy to actually make these materials. Um, because the, the, the solar cell is so thin, also the, the, the path that the current has to go is shorter and we can live with more defects, we can live with less perfect material and for this we can, and, and can use simpler uh, preparation methods. And um, it's vertically integrated. What does that mean? In a factory, the glass goes in and the module comes out. It's not separated the making of the cell and the making of the module. When we make the, the, the module, when we make the cell, we make the module at the same time. And they're not cut from crystals. The, the, these thin films are evaporated or sputtered. And, and these modules are very flexible in terms of the current or the voltage or the shape that you want. And all this adds to lower cost. And the, the lower amount of energy that we need um, leads to a shorter energy payback time. Um, the energy payback time is the time that the solar module has to be out in the field to produce the energy that was used for its making. And in these calculations, people include everything, from the mining, from the transport, um, from the putting out of the, of the, of, of the modules. And um, you see here, for silicon wafers, it's bet between a year and one and a half years, and thin films are lower than a year. These, are, these calculations are done for locations in uh, southern Europe. And thin film solar cells can also be made uh, flexible and lightweight. Um, you don't have to put them on glass. You can put them on a foil, on a, on a metal foil or a plastic foil and open whole new applications for that. And they have pretty good efficiencies um, with the material I'm looking at, carborundum gallium selenide. The record efficiency is now 23.3%. That compares with, okay, I have to compare it on the next slide on the next but one slide. Just want to say to show the, the learning curve again. And here's the learning curve for thin film modules. And the absolute price at the given time is the same, but because the the cumulative projection is lower, the the if if you compare the learning curves, thin film does have the chance to go cheaper. Um, Thin film is produced. There are essentially two different technologies, carborundum gallium selenide and cadmium telluride that are in the moment in the production. There was, is a third one, amorphous silicon, but you see it's actually going down and um, I'm, I'm not gonna speak about that further. And um, there are new, new factories are coming online. And I'm not talking about the announcement, I'm talking about the factories that are currently being built. And um, the production will increase even more. Of course, there are also huge silicon factories going on. So I'm not sure we're gonna increase the share of thin film modules, but there will be thin film modules produced. And here is the comparison of the efficiencies Silicon comes in two different variations. And here is the cadmium telluride and the CITS. And here is the fact, the real life fact, the, the real life efficiencies that you can actually get in the factory. And what we should keep in mind that two thirds of the, of the photovoltaic market is this multi-crystalline, the cheaper silicon. And here the thin film modules compare very favorably. Um, I mentioned the, 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 the options, carborundum gallium selenide and cadmium telluride. Um, there are other options, maybe you have heard of kesteride. Um, this is 
an interesting option because it doesn't have indium or gallium, which are critical materials, but at the moment the efficiencies are not very good and um, there is a fundamental problem with the, with the material that we haven't solved yet. And I'm sure you've heard about the halide perovskite or the hybrid perovskites. There is a lot of excitement at the moment. And why is this excitement? You can see that here. This is the traditional uh, cur the, the historical curve of the efficiency of silicon modules. And this is the curve of the perovskite. Uh, it's not modules, it's the cell, the best cells in the lab. It has, it has in, the, in the last few years, it, this material has seen a dramatic uh, the development in the efficiency and, and um, th there are very big hopes um, uh, uh, associated with this material because of this dramatic increase. What one should keep in mind is that this material builds a lot on uh, the the work we heard about also yesterday that is done on disensitized solar cells and on organic solar cells, on solar cells built on molecules. Um, the, the, the knowledge developed in this area helped accelerate this curve because they knew exactly what they need to use for the contacts and, and how to make these cells. It's a fantastic semiconductor. Um, you can an important um, characteristic of a, I'm not gonna go in this, I don't have time. It's a, it's a very good uh, a semiconductor, but it has a problem with the stability. And this, before this goes into a module, we have to solve um, the stability. It has to be stable at high temperatures. And um, so I've been talking a lot about um, the efficiency of the solar cell. How do we measure the efficiency? What we measure is the IV curve of a solar cell. And the solar cell in the dark is a diode. A diode means it has a forward current where the current actually flows, and it has a backward direction where there is no current. And when we shine light on this, this curve shifts downward. We generate a current that's called the short circuit current, and by this, we also have an open circuit voltage. Now, this cell doesn't produce any power here because the voltage is zero and it doesn't produce any power here because the current is zero and the power is the product of the current and the voltage. And, but in between, it has a maximum of the, of the power and the relation, the, the, the ratio of this of the voltage and power at this maximum, at the voltage and current at this maximum power point um, is to the open circuit and open uh, short circuit uh, uh, values is called the fill factor. And therefore we can write the power here as the short circuit current times the open circuit voltage times the fill factor and the efficiency is the power that comes out at this point divided by the power of the light that comes in. This is how we measure the efficiency in the lab, and this is also how we measure the efficiency of modules that are out in the field. And um, so, the, what are these solar cells? Essentially, a solar cell consists of a semiconductor. What is a semiconductor? It's maybe you've heard, seen Bohr's atomic model. You have an atom has a nucleus and the electrons are around. And um, in this simple model, the electrons are only allowed on certain orbits. Nowadays, we don't think in terms of orbits, we think in terms of orbitals. But the message of Bohr's atomic model still exists, uh, is true, that the electrons can exist only at certain energies. And in between, there is nothing. The electron cannot exist in this forbidden range. And if we now take many atoms and put them into a crystal, the electron doesn't only see its own atom, it also sees the next atom and the over next atom and the over next atom. And by this, this 
Discrete energy levels develop into energy bands, but what is still there is this energy gap. And a semiconductor is a material where the band below the gap is filled with electrons, and the next band is completely empty. And that means we have to first add energy to, to get a current, because nothing can move down here, it's all full, and nothing can move up here because it's empty. And this band gap is also the absorption edge, as Joseph has explained. And, and it's, you want it as small as possible to get a high current, and you want it as high as possible to have a high voltage, and um, so you have to find an optimum, which is a compromise between the two. And you need to find this compromise um, because of these losses. If the energy of the photon is smaller than the band gap, it's just going to go through, you're going to lose it. If the energy of the photon is higher than the band gap, you're going to lose this part of the energy because the electron will be up here and then very quickly thermalize to the band gap and we will lose this part of the energy and this um, Competing processes uh, give us the, 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 the shock equalizer maximum that, that Joseph showed. And um, this is not the right direction. Um, so it's a solar cell never makes, a single solar cell never makes perfect use of the solar spectrum. And one solution you just heard from, from Joseph, we, we, we shift the, the energy of the solar spectrum to the range where the solar cell works optimal. Another solution is a tandem solar cell, where we put two solar cells on top of each other, and one uses the blue photons, the high energy photons, more efficiently, and the second one uses the low energy photons more efficiently, and by putting those two together, we can go to higher energy. Um, for this, obviously, we need a good bottom cell. We have that. We have silicon. We have very good CIGSE solar cells. We can use them. But we need a good top cell and with a good efficiency. And this is part of the interest in these perovskite solar cells. They actually have to come with, with good band gaps, with wood, good uh, white gap um, uh, uh, solar cells. And this is a graph my colleague Bernd Grech from Berlin recently made. Um, it's historical and it's a prediction. Here are the single uh, solar cell efficiencies, CIGS and, and the crystalline silicon. Um, this is the prediction for modules. This is based on a technology roadmap where all the industry got together and thought what is likely going to happen. And um, so the, these cells make these modules. And here's the pair of sky single cells. And the red dots are various um, um, tandem solar cells. So at the moment, these tandem solar cells are, are not better than the best single cells, but they have the, they're new. They have a chance to develop much faster. So in terms of lab cells, um, we can go considerably beyond the single cells and also make then modules with higher efficiencies. And these values that you see here, they were made with perovskite top cells. And um, I would like to make another proposal. Um, this, I showed you the copper indium gallium selenide that has a band gap of usually as we use it, one point, around 1.1, similar to silicon. But it had this material has a cation, the sulfide, copper indium gallium sulfide, which has the same chalcopyrite structure. And its band gaps, they vary from 1.5 electron volt to 2.4 electron volt. So they're exactly in the range that's interesting for, for the top cells, for solar cells. And um, these sulfide solar cells, they have been investigated for a long time, and they got around 10% efficiency, and then people lost interest, and 
stopped working on these solar cells. But recently, um, published last year, um, the, a, a company in Japan, Solar Frontier, they looked into this material again and they got a very good efficiency of 15.5%. And in the last conference, they showed almost 17% um, for these sulfide solar cells. Um, so people have worked on them and all of a sudden they're better. What happened? What um, the Japanese did, they increased the temperature during the making of the solar cells. This is um, a solar cell at standard um, uh, temperature and then they went up to almost 700 degrees. Um, as the, as the temperature when, when, they, when they actually make the solar cells. So this, this higher temperature was very good for these solar cells. And now we wanted to know what actually happens when, when we increase the temperature, what, what is the effect, and we looked at photoluminescence. Photoluminescence is a method where we can learn about the electronic structure of the material. I've showed you the bank gap. When we now shine light on it, we offer energy to excite um, the, this was too fast, to excite the electron. And um, this is done by a laser. And then the electron eventually will fall down again and emit another photon. And we can measure this photon. And it, in, in these um, semiconductors, there are defects. And some of those defects, we need them, and some of those defects are actually bad. And the electron can also fall into the defect, and then we can also see the photons and, and use these spectra to learn about the defect. And when we now do this for the sulfide with a low temperature process and a higher temperature process, you see this is the band-band transition, and this is a defect-related transition. So what we see is we have less deep defects when we go to higher temperature. And when we look closely, we actually see these are two. There's one and there's another one here. And a deep defect is bad for the solar cell. And it's bad for the solar cell because it takes, it takes away um, the electrons from, from the high energy level and the, the, the electrons cannot contribute to the, to the open circuit voltage of the solar cell. Now, we have a way to look at the open circuit voltage of the solar cell before we make the solar cell. And this is by, also by photoluminescence, we can measure the quasi Fermi level splitting. Now, what is the quasi Fermi level splitting? What is the quasi-Fermi level? What is the Fermi level in the first place? Now, the Fermi level is like the, the, the level of water in a bucket. If we have a lot of electrons, we call this an N-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is high. And if we have very few electrons, and then in, a sem in the semiconductor, when there are um, uh, the, when we have, when we have very few electrons up here, we have holes down here. Um, and then the, we have very little electrons and, uh, and, and the thermal level is low. Now when we shine light on the, on the semiconductor, we take electrons from the valence band and put it in the conduction band. So we generate electrons up here and holds down here. So the Fermi level at the same time would have to move up and down, which obviously is not possible. And, um, but because of the thermalization, we still have a decent distribution of electrons and holes um, in the bands, and we can define two Fermi levels, which are not real Fermi levels, because there are two, and we call them quasi-Fermi levels. And this distance here, um, gives us the maximum voltage that we can get out of the semiconductor. And we can measure that by photoluminescence. If you look at the situation um, where we have a low Fermi level splitting with few electrons and holes and a high Fermi level splitting, 
Um, the distance between the furthest energy electrons that can happen is shorter in this case than in this case, and thus our photoluminescence spectrum um, goes to higher energies when we have a higher quasi-fermi level splitting. Now we can get a higher quasi-fermi level splitting by um, either shining more light on, which we did here, but if we compare different samples and we shine the same amount of light on, if one sample has, um, is good and has a low amount of defects, it will have a higher quasi-fermi level splitting and um, the, the, the photoluminescent spectrum will be further out. And now we measured the quasi-fermi level splitting um, as a function of the defects that we saw in the PL spectrum and what here's the that and the, the, we can get a high quasi-fermi level splitting only when the small guy is low. So it's the small defect at 0.8 electron volt, that's the problem. And it's actually there, we see it in low temperature photoluminescence. And um, I just leave the conclusions there. So we can, by photoluminescence, we can learn something about the semiconductors that helps us to improve the cellar cells. Thank you, Susanne.